Julian Assange became something other than a whistleblower. You know, he became part of a uh, an American revolutionary movement. And I think, you know, what it, what it comes down to is, I mean, it's if we accept for the time being that okay, Julian Assange and Donald Trump and the Russians felt that. Uh, uh, American and Eurocentric neoliberalism were so destructive and so corrupt that we needed to take it down by any means necessary. Right? That that since the the sort of Rockefeller, Rothschild, Soros, CIA backed internationalism that. America had been practicing, um, you know, since, you know, the, the, the Shah of Iran and, uh, 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 the, the, you know, the, the banana companies and, uh, you know, the, the, that sort of American style of, uh, uh, you know, the creating the, you know, creating and exploiting banana republics and trying to create a kind of one world corporatist, uh, network, that that was so dangerous and so awful that it created these strange bedfellows of revolutionaries who believed that the people need to um, rise up against this. And that even though, eh, eh, even though it seems awful, that even reaching out to the Russians and working with them against the the America's own deep state may look like uh, treason, but it's a by any means necessary, you know, Malcolm X level action against this tyranny. Um, that's pretty heavy. So if you if if not that we have to believe that that's true, but if we believe that they believe that, um, which it seems that they did, you know. Because now that they're the, now they're at the place where saying, well, I didn't collude, but even if I did collude, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, and and you see all the interactions between the players of those three camps. Um, what is that? Now that's that to me. That's moving beyond whistleblower for Assange. So then, what he's done is picked a side and decided he's going to release. Uh, uh, he's going to release the information he has in ways that are calculated to do the greatest damage to the people and institutions that he perceives to be his enemies. And I understand. I mean, he hates Obama um, and, and, and Clinton because, you know, they're the ones that, that were tracking him down and, you know, preventing him from, uh, from, you know, coming to America or living in England or doing any of the things that he wanted to do. So he came to see, you know, and perhaps correctly, he came to see the, you know, America as uh, more committed to protecting its deep state, deep state secrets than uh, uh, promoting the values of, of freedom of expression on which it was supposedly founded. Mm. Right. You know, I don't know about, you know, I, I mean, these people, you know, guys like Julian Assange are playing in much, you know, deeper, scarier waters than I've ever gone. I'm not. I'm not I'm not that daring, but I'm also kind of not that angry, and and I I don't think he just did the the original WikiLeaks mission is different than what WikiLeaks did in that last election cycle. You know I don't know if that I have no idea. If that's germane to extradition uh, uh, demands or anything like that, you know, I'm, I'm not that up on who did what and how extradition law works or whatever. But, um, you know, J Julian Assange was I, – I thought of him in the same light as like Ed Snowden or Chelsea Manning. And now I kind of don't. Now I feel like he's more of a pol more, much more a political operative than 
a a pure uh, you know information giver. Right, I understand that, and and I guess with with WikiLeaks as a um, as an organization, let's say beyond this recent. Uh, election cycle and the recent controversy around the DNC email leaks. I don't want to get into that, but it, it, when we're discussing peer-to-peer networks and we're discussing the changes in technology uh, that we're, we've seen over the past several decades, I, I see WikiLeaks as a response to that, as a, um, as something that is trying to provide transparency where there is little to no transparency available, and. And did you did you have any hope or optimism that WikiLeaks as as a model could potentially catch on, and that it would be a really positive development in the realm of the internet and digital te- digital technology? That there are these organizations that could emerge that could provide transparency for political and uh, economic institutions that are ultimately trying to exploit us in some fashion or another. I mean, yes and no. Um, I I do see the value in government uh, being able to uh, preserve uh, opacity on a certain level. I mean, you know, I mean, there's the obvious cases if it's like, you know, the, the, there's a military action that we want to do. You know, there's a, let's say there's a child that's kidnapped by a regime in some country. Um, and we plan then, okay, this is the secret plan on how we're going to get that child back to safety. Um, I would be bummed if, you know, a, a, uh, freedom of information website decided to post the plans to rescue that child before the child's released and thwart that effort. You know, so that's an extreme example, but it's, there's still times when be- the world is not yet perfect <laughs> and there are, there's just not. Mm-hmm. And it, as we move towards that state of perfection, maybe some future, we have to accept that there's times when you may want to say something to someone and not to someone else, that it's, that it's politically and even ethically appropriate to withhold certain information. Um, and if government is not allowed to do that, if if diplomats are not have have no ability to do that, then I don't know. I think uh, I think we we disable things. You know, there's there's just as we as humans want our privacy. Um, I think some institutions need to be able to do things confidentially, to do things in private session. Uh, and so, so I'm not, I just don't, I don't buy the total transparency of all things at all times is absolutely required. Right. Well, I think what's uh, difficult is that I, I understand the scenarios that you're bringing up, but I think oftentimes what is revealed is things that have happened in the, in the past. I mean, the, 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 I, I don't, maybe in the future we'll see this happen where, You'll see in real time, uh, freedom of information websites like you mentioned that could could emerge, and they're like revealing something that's happening at the moment. Okay, there's a rescue operation. Let's reveal for some reason, you know, what's going to happen and how they're going to go about this operation. Um, that that's definitely possible. But I think more than anything, a lot of times these things re- involve, you know, like with the DNC email leaks, whether or not how that came about, who provided that information to WikiLeaks or not, they're not really disputing what was actually in the emails, right? They're not disputing the fact that the election was rigged in favor of Hillary Clinton, that there was all of this this media campaign to to enhance Donald Trump's profile in the media so that more people paid attention to him and that made it easier, supposedly, for Clinton to win the election. You know, all these things are revealed in these emails, which indicate that you know, these institutions do need more transparency because they're not democratic in the, at all. The, you know, it's a facade to assume otherwise. And and that's the that's the value that I see. And that's really when we're talking about the future of of technology, the future of the Internet. Um, I do see maybe WikiLeaks is an, it is definitely an imperfect organization led by an imperfect human being. And as you laid out with the previous question, I totally agree with you on those points. Um, I just really was asking as sort of an overall trend, I, I guess it's very important to me to see 
that if we're actually going to bring about this more positive future with the technologies we have that you have gone in great depth in your work discussing, uh, that, you know, transparency and WikiLeaks and these types of political organizations or, or transparency organizations are really going to be a big part of that in some form or another. That's my, my general opinion. Yeah. I mean, we're going to see I, whether or not the Democratic Party was transparent. We knew even from the outside that these super delegate people, you know, we're running the whole shebang, you know, from the beginning, it was like, oh, wait a minute, there's this Bernie guy. Oh, but the superdelegate people won't like Bernie because what are superdelegate people? Superdelegate people are the institutional ballast of this thing. I mean, the reason why, you know, Trump won his primary and Bernie didn't win his is because the Republican Party is less controlled. You know, by mm-hmm. its super, su- I don't know if they have super delegates. I don't think they do in the Republican Party. Yeah. So the the Democratic Party is set up to prevent something wild like a Trump from happening, which in a way is good, right? Right. Because if the Republican Party had that, then you know they could have. Uh, uh, well, in a way, is good uh, uh, to those of us who think that that you know the Trump uh, the Trump administration may cause more more harm than it than it prevents. Um, that that the party having some control over its, uh, who it nominates, uh, would have been, or could have been an interesting thing. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, people don't realize is that, you know, the, the political party domination process is not necessarily democratic. You know, they could decide these things in a back room somewhere and that's that these are parties, you know, you can, you, the, the election that happens later is democratic, but, but the, the nomination process is really up to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I, uh, yeah. And I, and I appreciate your insight into that. I just wanted to sort of pose that question to you. I don't know how many people ask you about that particular subject. So I just wanted to pose that. Not so question. much. It's yeah. just, you know, the, the, those internet conversations or those email threads, you know, between, uh, Donna Brazil and, you know, John Podesta or whatever, that's, our equivalent of the back room with those guys smoking cigars, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. in the, that you, at least that I imagine, you know, are we going to put up Teddy Roosevelt this time? Or are we going to, you know, <laughs> Benjamin Harrison, you know, I, I, I don't think those, 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 those were ever, uh, uh, ever not fraught with what we could only call corruption or bias. And, in some ways, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is you know, the the transparency offered by the internet is slowly eroding the backroom politics um, that that you know that may be eroding uh, you know what's left of democracy. The the other question though then is um, and I wrote about this in a piece somewhere. I should I should do a big thing on this, but is you know whether or not democracy works. You know, I, I met a former secretary of state and gotten this long conversation about democracy. And he finally asked me, he said, well, when are you going to accept that that democracy was a failed experiment? Mm-hmm. You know, that we just are too dumb and too, uh, you know, media influenced to be trusted with something as important as the election of political leaders. Right.